All right, so uh, what we're going to talk about is uh, the official title of the talk is J Just Do It. It's raising money and uh, creating a product either in or out of Silicon Valley. So I would hope that a number of people are interested in that. I certainly know that I would be if I was in your position. So uh, my, name is, my name is actually Nicola, but I go by Nick because uh, in Western countries, they don't really understand that if you're a guy and your name is Nicola. My name is Nikola Vladimir Bicinic. I was born in Croatia in 1974. It was Yugoslavia then. And I want to do this thing a little bit shorter and have more of a dialogue, so r I'll leave about 15 minutes, maybe 20 minutes for questions, and we'll see as many questions as we have. So I'll tell some stories about my experiences and what I've done in the past and what I've learned that might be useful to you guys uh, on your journey. Before I do that, can I have a quick show of hands of who in the audience is, uh, is a developer? One, two, three. And who is who would who would consider themselves an entrepreneur? Okay, so who didn't hold their hands up in either one of those two questions? All right, so that's not bad. We got a pretty good mix here. So let's see. Really rapid story of my life so far, just so you can understand the context from which I'm telling you these stories. I was born in Croatia. I spent a number of years there when I was younger. I went to university in Cambridge. I um, I then moved to London and I had my first startup in the UK. Uh, after running that startup for six years, I sold it completely and took a bit of time off and lived in Hawaii. Uh, I lived in Hawaii for two years, which was a lot of fun. Probably still would be a lot of fun, but I'm not doing that anymore. Um, I then fell in love. I moved to Vancouver, uh, Vancouver in Canada. Uh, I made movies for a few years. I traveled around the world and made a documentary about mercenaries. And uh, then I decided that uh, I was actually... I've I never stopped being a geek, so I wanted to go back into tech. And I did another startup, a startup called Echo Echo, which was a location sharing company. And ultimately, uh, that in indirectly brought me down to Los Angeles. Anyone else want some coffee while he's making some? No? OK. <laughs> uh, we'll just keep going, shall we? So uh, the, the official purpose of this talk is to talk about how to build products and how to raise money. Now. I'm sure a lot of you already know how to build various aspects of products. Perhaps you already know how to build companies. Perhaps, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that was said in the previous talk that you might already know about or that you might be curious about. To d in today's day and age, it's so easy to find out lots of information online. The problem with finding out information online is that you could sit there and go, well, wait a second, if I'm not the next Instagram, then I'm useless. And it's, it's slightly skewed. You know, you read, you read about all the big success stories, but you don't read about the stories that are okay. And you certainly don't read about the stories that are failures. And we all know that 99% of things that happen in the startup world are failures. So I wanted to talk, sort of do a reality check and talk about various different things that I've learned. First and foremost, let me start with a simple sentence. This actually might be wrong. This might be a hundred times less important. Ideas are much less important than execution. And I'll tell you a funny story from my past which illustrates this. Um, let's see. When I was uh, 20, 20, 21 years old, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a long time ago now because I was born in 1974. So I had made uh, the world's first animation in a web page. And now, you know, given how long uh, HTML5 has been around and before that how long Flash has been around, animations and web pages don't mean anything. It's like, whatever, everybody has those. But when I was younger, it was very rare to do this. So because I made the world's first animation, I was invited to San Francisco. They gave me the ticket and there was a award ceremony. I was invited to San Francisco for the one of the first worldwide web awards. And I was nominated as the most interactive design in the amateur category. I was amateur because I was just a student. And being from Eastern Europe and being a developer, I had a, a pretty big ego. And I thought, this is, this is fucking awesome. I'm, I'm finally, I'm being recognized for the brilliant genius that I am. So I flew out to San Francisco and I sat with all the other people who were nominated. And I thought, I'm going to you know, show them how cool I am. And I'm at the award ceremony lunch. And this guy is sitting next to me. And he goes, uh, I say, well, so what, what, what did you build? You know, what, what's your idea? And he says, oh, you know, I'm one of the nominees for most interactive website. Okay, okay, so what is it? He says, well, you know, it's a way that you can check your email with a web page. And, and I thought, what the fuck? 
this is ridiculous. I can do that. I mean, I built a way of checking email through a web page myself. It took like half an hour to do. You connect POP3 to HTML, and oh, there you go. Check your email through a web page. Well, I was an idiot because that guy sold for, for Hotmail for $400 million about six months later. So what I'm trying to say is that it's, it's, in, it's, a, it's a silly story, but it's true. It's, um, it's amazing how common it is not just for engineers, but uh, in my case, because I have a background as an engineer, I can speak to that very directly. It's amazing how common it is for entrepreneurs to think that the idea is the biggest part of the problem. I have 100 ideas every day, and I'm, I'm sure a lot of you guys do, and I know that the guys in California do all the time. But the problem is that idea doesn't mean shit unless you can actually create a prototype deliver a product that you can convince either customers to use or investors to invest in or people to buy. So that's all. It's, it, I know it's, it sounds like a really simple sentence. And of course, you have to start with an idea. With no idea, you can't keep going. But the idea is just the beginning. The idea, without, if you can't actually execute, if you can't figure out how to move forwards, you don't really have anything. So um, let's see. Uh, a lot of this stuff was discussed in the previous presentation. How many of you he were here for the previous presentation? Almost everybody? Well, well over half. So one of the key things to think about when you're looking at ideas is, is why. So for example, what, there's various different ways of talking about the phrase why. You can say just why, or you can say what is the pain point. Vitaly talked a lot about definitions of pain point or user-centric design. You can also just say who cares, who gives a shit. I mean, for example, I used to say as a joke, uh, four square for dogs. Awesome, let's build an application where you can take your dog and when your dog you know, pisses on the side of the street, you mark and check in and you can see where all these other dogs are pissing on the street. And it's a funny joke, except that some idiot put $500,000 into an application which was exactly like this. So it's, it's amazing how there, there's a lot of stuff out there that can be built that doesn't have to be built. I mean, I actually wanted to ask Vitaly a question of what he thinks about Foursquare, only because I know the answer. He thinks it's dead and useless. So, um, going back to the actual point here, it's very, very important when you start thinking about how you're going to create a product, what is the pain point and what are you solving? Because the very first thing that the investor is going to ask you when you're pitching, or that a user might think about when they're trying to use the application, is why am I using this? And, of course, it doesn't have to be a very complicated reason. If you make a funny game, whether it's Angry Birds or anything else, there's no reason, there's no big reason why you would play it. It's just entertainment, it's just fun, it's just a waste of time. But, uh, and that's okay, because you can make a very good business on entertaining things. But if you're trying to actually build a utility, or you're trying to build a, a, an application that people are going to open once, twice, five times per day, and they'll keep coming back to it over and over again, there has to be a reason why. So, um, I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit to uh, the various different cycles of ideas and products. Often you'll hear, and you might have read about this already, you'll hear investors complain about I certainly did when I first started pitching investors on ideas. They'll say stuff like, it's not a product, it's a feature. And you go, what the fuck does that mean? Well, what they're trying to say is, we think your idea is a small component that might be good, but it doesn't have an overall framework within which it can survive. So it's a bullshit criticism in one way, because what is Google? When 90% of Google's beginning was a feature, it was search, except the difference between a product and a feature is only that you use it over and over again. So don't be too scared about the idea of whether it's a feature or a product or a company. Don Dodge, who was in here before, who some of you might know, and if you don't, you should hear him speak. He's a, he's a very connected and very wise guy. Uh, he likes to say that uh, it's never been easier to, to build a product, but it's never been harder to build a company. Starting from the beginning, saying, hey, I want to build a company, that's very rare. There are people out there who come up with those kinds of ideas, who come up with an idea of something that could eventually grow into being a company. Many of the big companies you guys use every day didn't start out that way. For example, Twitter. Um, uh, Jack Dorsey and Dev Van Biz have all gone on record to say that they weren't building a company. They just had an idea for something that might work. It started as a feature. Eventually, they started getting feedback. They figured out how they could make a product out of it. And then, with enough usage, it became a company. But don't 
what the, the takeaway from this slide is I wouldn't worry too much about people who will say, well, hang on a second, you've just made one little small thing. What the fuck, what is that? How can you make that into a product? That's okay. If you don't spend too much time or too much money on it, just think about what can I do to make this? M maybe, maybe, maybe you don't have to build a product. Maybe you can build a feature that can be made as an SDK and that you can then license to other people to use. Uh, the, the reason I point this out is because it's extremely common when you talk to whether it's angel investors or advisors or maybe venture capital people or some of the accelerators that already exist in, in Poland and in many parts of Eastern Europe, it's extremely common that the guys you talk to, they like to think that they know everything. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't know shit. But one of the ways in which they like to be smart is they like to give you critiques on what you're doing. Because they don't want to just sit there and go, congratulations, uh, I don't want to invest. Because that's not very nice. So usually they go, I don't want to invest because, and sometimes they'll say, because this is a feature, not a product. So don't think about ahead of time, what does that mean? And have an answer for these things. So that's a feature, not a product. Well, you know what? It's a feature, but we think it'll grow like this and this and this, and this is what we're going to be testing out, and this is how we might take the next steps. So, um, of course, after that, you clearly need to think about, as, peop as you noticed yesterday when, I don't know how, actually yesterday was a pre-day for the conference, so maybe many of you weren't here. We had a, a pitch contest where I was one of the judges in one of the groups and many of the other people here were also judges. And there was various startups that had three minutes to pitch. And afterwards, we asked them questions for three more minutes and we gave them feedback. And it was extremely common for startups to not say, not make it clear how are they going to get users, not make it clear how they thought they were ever going to make money. Uh, those are very important things to think about when you're at the idea stage and when you're making prototypes. I mean, uh, Vitaly went through cycles of design and iteration and architecture and development, but he didn't think, he didn't talk about so much because it wasn't the purpose of his talk the basic parameters of what is this product for? How do you intend for people to discover it? How do you intend for people to use it? How do you intend for more users to come in? And ultimately, how will you make money? Investors really only give a shit about one thing, which is return on investment. So unless, unless your business model is, we will get so many users that Facebook will buy us for a billion dollars, in which case, good luck. I mean, if you do it, congratulations. I've never done it, and most people don't. But usually you have to try and think about a product that's useful and eventually you'll figure out some way of making money. If you, do, if you genuinely don't know how you're ever going to make money, your chances of raising money from investors, I would say, are extremely small. Uh, maybe if you're a phenomenal UI guy and you can create a product that just looks magical and everybody wants to use it, you could do it. But usually you have to have at least an idea of how this one day might turn into a habit that might turn into some dollars. Um, I think it's important to state, I've talked to Andre about this quite a lot, I think it's important to state that it's possible to build complete products in Eastern Europe. It's extremely tempting, and I know this from talking to my friends in Croatia and from talking to various different groups in Poland and in the Ukraine. There's a lot, there's this sense that uh, paradise is in Silicon Valley or in New York. And maybe that was true in, in you know late 80s or early 90s, but it's not the case anymore. In fact, if you try to go over, even if you have the relationships and the connections, if you try to go over to Silicon Valley too early, there is, you'll run into problems that are unnecessary. For example, you, if you come there with an idea that's half complete, and then you know, hang out with some friends and you go, okay, I'm gonna try and see if I can find some investors and see what happens, you're competing with tens of thousands of people who are trying to do the exact same thing. Whereas over here, you have the brain power, you have the talent, you have the, you have the infrastructure to be able to create your ideas, and then when you have them built, then go over there. Because then you have something that those guys don't, because you have an idea that's already been built, and, inf and guess what, you could even test it. You could test it in a local marketplace, and you could prove something, and go over there, you know what, this fucking works in Poland. We built this parking solution, we built whatever it is, we built this new social network, whatever you might be building. You can test it locally, and then you can go over there and actually do something. So, there's a... By the way, am I speaking way too quickly for everybody? Do you want me to slow down, or is it it's all good? All right, cool. So there's a temptation in, in a nice, 
I don't feel so bad saying Eastern Europe as a general box because I am Croatian, so it's not like I don't know what I'm talking about. I'm, it's just useful to make a grouping. I know it's not the same country, I understand, but it's similar. Uh, there's, a, there's a weird thing that happens, and I've seen this again in Croatia and in Poland and in the Ukraine. There's a weird mix of people don't think they're good enough to, to play at the world level, and at the same time, they also are arrogant on a, on a small scale. So I'll give you an example of both of those. There's a number of guys that I know who, who for example, there's a guy who works for Google right now at a fairly senior position. Uh, no, Jan, it's not who you're thinking. The, uh, the, and he, uh, whenever I have a conversation with him, he, um, he says, I'll ask him a question about something, like, what do you think about this product, or what do you think about this business strategy that Facebook is doing? And he'll say, um, I don't really like to make a comment because I'm not an expert. And I'm like, I go, I don't, what the fuck are you saying? I'm not, I don't know anything. I'm not an expert on anything, but I, I talk shit all the time. Sometimes I'm right, sometimes I'm wrong. But I'll throw out an idea, and then people argue about it. I mean, it's just like you do in school. When you're in university or when you're in school, you talk amongst your friends and you have ideas, and you, that's how we learn. So I don't, first of all, it's, I think it's important that you should never feel like you're not good enough to compete at a world stage, because everybody, People who are, first of all, you're making an effort to come to a conference like this and you clearly are all either part of a development team or part of a product team or trying to make your own. Don't feel like you're not good enough. These, the, there hasn't been a breakout success in the consumer startups, at least, in Eastern Europe, but it's only a matter of time. Silicon Valley was fucking built on the backs of immigrants. It, without, If you took away the Eastern European immigrants that are in Silicon Valley, 50% of their products wouldn't exist. So the reason why that's the case is because we all went over there, and because that's where all the money was and that's where all the infrastructure was, but we don't have to do that anymore. We can actually do it ourselves. But it's like I said, it's important to, to I think, understand that you can do it and we, there are teams here are good enough to do it. But I think it's also important for, and this is a little bit of what Vitaly was talking about, the developers shouldn't be arrogant. Uh, because product and UX is an absolutely vital component here. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a very common trend in, in Eastern Europe. And again, I was part of this trend, so I speak from experience. I'm not just observing. That, that there's this sense of, well, we know better, and we know better than the customer. We don't. Th there's not enough customer-centric thinking, and I'm talking about from the point of view of the very beginning, the the architecture and the idea, and what does this really mean? You just go, well, I'll figure out what it is, and what do they know? They're fucking idiots. I'll just make it, and and somehow the magic of my product will translate onto what these people use, and that's that's a bad idea, because if you uh, if you do that. Uh, you will end up building stuff that people don't use. And if you build stuff that people don't use, even if you manage to get money from Accelerator or State or Friend or Investor, uh, the money is going to be wasted because you're not going to be paying enough attention to what the customers are doing. Um, so yeah, that's, uh, I mean, this whole line, Products UX is vital. It's, it was Vitaly's whole presentation, so I don't have to go into that in, in too much detail. But of course, if anybody has any opinions or they disagree with me or they want to tell me I'm full of shit, by all means do that. You can do that afterwards or when we do the Q&A. So, um, as far as my experiences in Silicon Valley, uh, the, the sentence on the slide says you only need one pitch to work. Uh, what I mean by that is exactly what I say. You only need one pitch in order to succeed. The question is which pitch? Who do you pitch to? So, in my case, when I, I, I never lived in Silicon Valley. I still don't live there. I live in Los Angeles, which I know sounds, well, okay, it's right next to San Francisco. I mean, it's the same, but it's not. If you're not in Silicon Valley, you're not in Silicon Valley as far as they're concerned. However, I can tell you from personal experience that you don't have to be. So when, when, I, uh, when I first started trying to make a network in Silicon Valley and trying to reach people, it, it certainly took a long time. It took about I thought, oh yeah, I'll have this done in three months, not a problem. Yeah, nine months later, we just had it, you know, the first investor close. And in my case, I don't know how many people I pitched, maybe, uh, I don't know, 100 people or something, if you add it all up. It's a lot of, lot of fucking meetings. And every time you think, this is the one, these are the, this is the guy who's really going to understand what I'm doing, and then 
10 minutes in, you just you realize that they're playing with their phone and they're not really paying attention. Then you can't leave because it's rude, so you wait and you waste another hour. But that's what happens. But then you find the one guy, and in this case, it is the guy that uh, Jan is thinking of, um, Don Dodge. Uh, I happened to, I was at a, at a startup conference and it's called Launch. I don't know how many of you guys know about it, but uh, Jason Calacanis, who used to run TechCrunch Disrupt, um, puts on this show called Launch. And it so happened that uh, w I pitched to a lot of people that were at Launch, and one of the guys that I pitched to was Don. And Don just said, I really like this idea, and I want to put you in front of Google Ventures. So he put me in front of Google Ventures. Google Ventures said, yes, we want to do this. And then everything suddenly happened in the space of a few weeks. But the point is, it's like nine months of shit and hard work, and then everything happens in a few weeks. So uh, the, the interesting story here isn't just that you need one pitch to work, but I wanted to tell a story about how this happened. So at um, the way TechCrunch Disrupt works and the way Launch works is you have one area, which is the stage, and that's the VIP area. So if you get selected to present on stage, then obviously the camera is on you and everybody's listening and everybody's tweeting about you, maybe, if you're good. And then you have another area, which is the startup alley. And startup alley is where everybody's sitting there. Here's my idea and here's my idea. And you sit there and you wait, and there's 50 companies there. And yes, the companies that are presenting on stage are also in Startup Alley, but there's maybe 50 or 100 companies in Startup Alley, and maybe 10 are on stage. So in theory, the guys in Startup Alley also have an opportunity to meet the investors and the people who are walking around there. Nobody tells you that you should get in there and actually harass people and pitch them directly and aggressively. They tell you to sit there by your laptop and wait for somebody to come by and say, oh, your product is blah, blah, blah. What do you do? But the problem is if you do that, you um, nothing will happen. So I guess the whole point about this, you only need one pitch to work, is there aren't, you don't, don't listen to the rules. Because if you listen to the rules, you'll fail. So in my case, when we went to launch, they specifically told us to wait for the investors to come to us and then pitch to them. And then if they like us, then they'll vote and maybe they'll put one of us up on stage. Yeah, that's bullshit because the people who did that, nothing happened. Nobody came to talk to them. So instead, we realized, me and one other guy, a different company, we realized in the space of the first 20 minutes that the investors are lazy and they're going to sit in the front row at, at, at launch the whole time listening to the big pitches. So every time there was a 10 minute break between pitches, we walked right up to the front and we said, hey, nice to meet you. By the way, blah, 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 blah. So what do you have? You have 60 seconds, maybe 90 seconds. But that's enough because the job of investors is to get deals. That's, that's their whole job. That their job it's, they call it deal flow. Deal flow is just the term for it in, in, uh, in English. And it's a strange word, but basically the idea is that they've got to have continuous deals going through. And sometimes they'll say yes and sometimes they'll say no. But without deal flow, they're dead. Because if they don't have deal flow but somebody else does, then they're not going to find the big next winning companies. So they want you to harass them. Of course, don't be a dick. You know, you don't have to like, if they're talking to their wife, you don't just like barge in and start talking to them. But they want you to harass them. And that's one of the reasons why the pitches are so important. Because in this case, this is exactly what I did. I ended up bothering Don. He listened to the first 60 seconds. And he goes, this is good. I want to hear more. Then I had him. Then I had his attention. Then he gave me the extra two, three minutes of attention. Then he says, okay, I'm going to put you on stage. And that was it. So the point is that if I'd listened to the rules, which is to sit by your laptop and you know just go, oh, okay, um, well, thanks a lot. By the way, would you like my... Oh, you don't want my card. Fuck you. Okay. If I'd done that, nothing would have happened. So uh, that's just, I guess, one more story. What else have we got? Um, seed money. So some of you already know this, but uh, some of you don't, so I thought it's worth mentioning. There's definitely opportunities for seed money locally. I don't know how competitive it is. I know in Croatia it's still really, um, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of about connections. I don't know if in Poland it's a bit more meritocratic, uh, but in Croatia, if you know the right people, you can maybe get the seed money, but if you don't, then you can't. So that sucks. But the point is, if you can't get it locally, leave. And well, I know it sounds easier to, oh, e great, Nick, congratulations. You're telling us to leave, but we don't want to leave. This is our home. Yeah, but Startup Chile is one example. And some of you might know about this, some of you might not. Startup Chile, the country Chile, is offering $40,000 for no equity. 
It's a grant. They give you $40,000. They give you a one-year work visa for Chile. And basically, they're looking for entrepreneurs to come from all over the world to come and be part of the Chile ecosystem. Well, guess what? It's free to apply. It doesn't cost anything. So there's zero reason. Well, of course, if you have a wife and a kid and you're building a house, yeah, you, it's not going to be easy for you to go away for six months. But there's many people who are young and aggressive and who have ideas. And $40,000 plus a work permit for a year, and you don't have to give away any of the company, that's a phenomenal offer. And there'll be others like it. The reason I put Hawaii on the slide is because one of the things I'm doing on the side is I'm putting together a similar program for the state of Hawaii. Um, it's not finished yet, but uh, we're in the process of uh, we're raising an early stage VC fund for Hawaii specifically to create a bridge between Eastern Europe and Hawaii because who doesn't want to go to Hawaii for six months? I mean, how awesome would that be? So, uh, yeah, that's the plan. But my point is Startup Chile already exists. You can apply for it. Look at, I mean, I, I could put up a URL, but I forgot. But just Google Startup Chile and you'll see the website. It's very easy to apply. Now, there's no one in here, from an ex at least no one I recognize from a Polish accelerator, but it's the Polish accelerator's job for this not to happen. If you have to go to Startup Chile or something like this, they've failed. Their whole point is the whole point of the ecosystem, what we've been discussing with Andrzej, is to create an environment. I'm just looking at the clock so I know there's enough time for questions. To create an environment that, that opportunities are here for you, so that way you can actually, if you have a good idea and if it's competitive enough that it could in theory win Startup Chile, not win, sorry, get a place, you should be in an in a accelerator or an incubator here because otherwise something, something bad is going on. What else have we got? Uh, I think that's the last slide. Yeah, don't be afraid to fail. Um, part of this is cultural. In, uh, in the one of the reasons why the United States has been so successful uh, in, in an entrepreneurial sense is that uh, failure in Silicon Valley is viewed almost like a badge of honor. For example, um, I'm sorry this is going to sound, I'm gonna, this is a one-sided story because I'm, I'm male, but when I was a teenager and there was a really hot girl that we all wanted to speak to, if you try to talk to the hot girl and you failed, they wouldn't go, oh, you idiot, how dare you try? They'd go, oh, well, you know, well done, somebody else has a go. So my point is, uh, if you didn't try, you'll never succeed. There's a, there's a phrase in, uh, in, in, um, in basketball, which is, you, uh, you miss 100% of the shots that you don't take. In other words, if you don't actually shoot, you can't, you can't score. So there's a, culturally, there's a, there's a stigma in Eastern Europe to failing in business. The idea is that if you try something, then you fail and you emotionally are a wreck, and then financially everybody views you as a loser. That's changing. I've, I've talked to a number of the guys in the accelerators, and that's changing culturally. But it's also something that's in the mindset of everybody in the country. They don't want to try because, oh, it'll never work, and oh, the system is against me, and uh, there's a hundred reasons why you don't do it. Just fucking do it because of the fact that if you don't, it doesn't take very much money and very much time to build a simple prototype. Maybe it's shit. It's probably going to be shit if it's your first idea. But so what? So make another idea. And then talk to, if you think it's okay, talk to three of your friends. And some of them will go, no, no, this is stupid because A, B, C. And those kinds of discussions are very useful. But if they say it's not stupid, then just keep going. So um, I'm sorry I don't have a, a full list of magic tricks of what you could do. And in fact... Part of the story here, I thought about doing a whole presentation on this, is that I failed pretty badly with my last company. I raised, um, I raised a million dollars from Google Ventures and Pro Founders in London, and uh, Don was one of the investors. The company was called Echo Echo. It was a location sharing system, and unfortunately, for a variety of different reasons, we couldn't make it viral enough in order for it to succeed. And it's, there's no developers working on it anymore. It's not, it's not killed. The product still exists, people still use it, but there's no further development because there's no more money. And did it kill me? No. And it's not because I made loads of money, not at all. It's, it's because the, the, the attitude of the investors is, you really fucking tried. Like We tried so many different things to make this thing work. And people, people look at you as though you learned so much from the process of trying, even if you fail. In many ways, you learn more if you fail, than if you succeed. Because sometimes if you succeed, sure, you might get rich, but you don't know why you succeeded. If you succeed quickly, I mean, you know, Instagram, did they really know, does Kevin Zistrom really know exactly what they did right so he could go and do it again? I mean, I have no proof of this, but I would argue that the answer is perhaps no. 
Whereas when you fail at something, you learn you learn loads of stuff because you learn it painfully the hard way. I mean, I, I lost money on the entire endeavor. It wasn't just the investors that lost money. It's also the entrepreneurs who lose money and time. And that's pretty much a wrap-up. So we'll have 15 minutes to have a conversation. But uh, this is my email. This is my Twitter handle. Um, feel free to follow me on Twitter. I sometimes say useful things. Sometimes I just say a bunch of shit. So, so long as you're happy to deal with that, that's fine. Otherwise, by all means, email me directly. And uh, if I can be any help with any kind of advice, I'll do that. If you ask me too many questions, I probably won't answer. But if you keep the questions like reasonable, then I'm happy to do that. So at that point, if anyone has any questions about how I went from Croatia to, uh, to Silicon Valley and how others might be able to do that, or anything else I said so far, go for it. Go, Don. <laughs> Don, you missed the whole presentation. That's all right. I can ask I know, a question. I know. I'm sure you can. So if you had to do it all over again, uh, would you do it? Or now that you're in the position you are now, do you think you could start a company anywhere? It's an interesting question. Um, I genuinely think you can start a, you can, I genuinely think you can build a product anywhere. Um, starting a company isn't something necessarily that I, I didn't think about starting companies when I was when I was younger, when I was first starting out. I mostly was just thinking about products. I absolutely think you don't need to be in Silicon Valley. If I could do it again, I would have done things very differently a long time ago because because uh, when I sold my first company in London, I would have I would have actually become a much more active angel investor back then. Um, I think that that was an opportunity lost for me. But to the big part of this question is, do I think it's possible, and this is something that we talked about throughout the presentation, do I think it's possible to start a company in Eastern Europe that can compete at a world level? Absolutely. The people are here and the ecosystem is, it's an early stage, but it's, it's strong enough. I mean, look at the caliber. Actually, this is one of the things that pisses me off, and you can tell your friends this. The caliber of people, the speakers that are here, and some of the, the, in, the investors and the, the connected individuals from Silicon Valley, it's actually kind of embarrassing that there isn't more people here. It's um, it's something. It's a uh, it's a shame. It's a shame that that uh, that that Andre and some of the team have put on a pretty awesome event, and there should be more people who are paying attention. Because I can guarantee you that there's more people in in Krakow and in Wroclaw, Warsaw, Poznan, Szczecin who could benefit from some of the stuff that's being discussed here. So yeah, I didn't mean to make that a sort of a negative thing, but I think it's a valid point. So continuing the, the, the previous question, uh, does the location of the he headquarters of the company can influence your pitches or uh, it can influence the rising of the money around yes, the world? Yes, yes, it absolutely can. Uh, when I was raising money for Echo Echo, uh, I was living in Los Angeles. The, some of the developers were in Croatia, some of the developers were in uh, Ukraine. And for sure, there are some investors who who will say, well, I only invest in companies that, uh, that I can drive to. There's a famous quote that I forget, but I'm sure, Don, you know who it is, um, of a guy who famously said this. The, the thing is, that's, that's an attitude that's changing. The, the, the arrogance of, of some of the Silicon Valley venture capitalists who were all concentrated in one area meant that they could dictate those rules. But the, the amount of money it costs to create a product has dropped sufficiently that they can't dictate those rules anymore. They, in fact, the, the angel investors, the sufficient numbers of them, that they're able to, you can kind of do an, a runaround to the venture capitalists, especially early on. And I mean, look, people like Don are traveling to Poland repeatedly because of the fact that Eastern European environments have a high concentration of smart individuals where you can get the deal flow early on before they've even gotten a chance to go over there. So, I mean, Don's not the only one. Dave McClure does the same thing. He famously does it. And you can bet that people are paying attention to the early trendsetters like Dave and Don because that's where, the, that's where the new ideas will come from. As I said, if you took away all the Eastern European immigrants that originally came to Silicon Valley, a lot of big companies would be would not be in the same position that they are today. No one else? Uh, another oh, one, sorry. yeah. Uh, okay, uh, a, a little bit different topic, but uh, as for pitches uh, and then raising the money, is that gather a lot of paperwork? Because if you like talk with VC, big VCs, you need to prepare like a lot of business plans and paperwork. Or it, you, you said that there is like one pitch that f uh, takes it all and is it more like a pitch and th this is it or 
then you if you need to prepare a lot of documents and after that you are the you well are the, the, pro the process the process varies depending on how much you're raising and who you're talking to and who's helping you out i can tell you from experience from my experiences and i can also tell you from the guys that i've spoken to the uh in in the consumer space meaning when you're making stuff that's for consumers not enterprise um, it's become less and less common to have uh, uh, business plans. In fact, I don't remember the last time I saw a consumer company with a business plan. The biggest, that doesn't mean that, the, that do, doing the business plan is a bad idea, but doing the business plan is not usually what you would do for an investor. The investors don't, don't really read them. It takes too long and most of the assumptions in the business plan are, look, in one year we are going to have two billion users. It's bullshit. However, doing a business plan is a very useful exercise for you as an entrepreneur because it forces you to think about what is this business, how is it going to scale, where do I think it's going to come from. Even if you're wrong, it's a useful exercise. But the single most useful thing you can do, again, this varies a little bit depending on, on what you're doing, is think about what is the message, how can you, the purpose of this elevator pitch that people talk about is in reality, can you say what your company is about in one sentence, in 30 seconds, in 60 seconds? Can you then have a deck that also repeats some of that in a different way? For example, the new company that I'm working on, uh, which happens to be real-time video speed dating, it's called FlickDate. We have a deck, we have a demo, but I very rarely use the deck. And the reason I very rarely use the deck is because most people don't have time to look at it. So they look at a demo or they listen to my 30-second pitch. And the reason I then follow up with the deck afterwards is because when they are talking to somebody else, whether it's a friend or another investor, you don't want them to have to pitch because them having to pitch is much harder. If they're really, really close to the product, if they're already invested, they could maybe do the pitch for you to another person. But usually I give them a deck in order to have additional material for them to send on. So yeah, I don't think it's absolutely necessary to have uh, a business plan, first of all, and second of all, you don't need loads of paperwork. You know, the, the pitches that I've done in VCs have literally been me talking, you know, first 10 minutes is spent on polite bullshit, uh, ha ha ha, nice to meet you, oh yeah, that's funny, you also went to this and I like this, oh, you invested in this. Then you have a whiteboard, maybe you have a demo, ideally you have a demo they can play with. By the way, um, Vitaly didn't mention this in his last presentation, but one of the big reasons why UX is so important is guess which part of your product the VC sees first, the fucking UX, because they touch it and they play with it and that's what they see. So it doesn't matter how amazing your database is, it does, but in the first instance, the first impression, a lot of that comes from the UX. So yeah, you have a demo, then you have a whiteboard, then you draw something, then you discuss stuff with them, and after that, who knows, there's no rules. But yeah, it's a, a lot of it is on you got to be able to communicate with them. If you can talk well, that's a good thing. I think we're almost running it. Well, no, we have seven minutes, so maybe we have time for one or two more questions. No? No one? Some people are nodding in the back knowingly. Oh, there we go. Yes. Okay. I would like to ask you about the uh, next thing. Actually, uh, let's call it strategies, how to launch uh, product, how to release product, and to sh um, uh, let's user know about uh, this product. For, from one point of view, uh, I was said, you should have the best product with the best uh, graphic design user interface. You should work a lot and uh, do the best. And after that, just share this product, release this product. And after is this uh, um, product will be successful. Uh, from another hand, uh, you don't need it. Just uh, quickly release this product, let people play with it. I collect feedback, uh, feedbacks from them, fix issues, uh, release next version, and, and so on. Uh, uh, do in this way. Uh, as it's also a successful way to um, for, for you. What what do you think? What is the best? Well, uh, 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 different people have different approaches to this. I would say that the latter option is the better, and I will refer back to an example uh, Vitaly used, which was color. If Color had released that product to any real humans, they would have gotten an immediate feedback of this is bullshit. And it never would have actually gotten to public release. So the Silicon Valley mantra of lean startups, which is um, fail early and fail often, is, is in a way you can translate that into product release cycles. The point is that the quicker you get your product out there, the quicker you'll see which bits people like and which bits they don't like and which bits don't work. Because no matter how good your QA is, and no, I don't include developer QA because that doesn't work. I mean proper QA. No matter how good your QA is, there's nothing that can replace the way in which people actually really use your product. But there is another way of looking at it. 
which is so sorry just to repeat i i agree with the idea of just get it out there kick it out and make it see what works see what doesn't work and then keep improving it and in fact the sooner you do that if you're if you only have a thousand or a hundred users who you're getting feedback from, nobody knows who you are anyway. So it doesn't matter if you get it wrong. Because that by the time you change it and change it again and change it again, then you can go, okay, now we're actually releasing it. I mean, Pinterest, for example, uh, th the guy, the CEO of Pinterest, he likes to say that uh, they launched five times. Because, because they kept launching and launching and launching and no one knew anything about them. And eventually, finally, they launched and they were there. So Excuse me, it was the same product. Same, same product, same, same brand. No, 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 not quite. Uh, sorry, same brand, but not the same product. The product kept changing. But the, uh, the, the point I wanted to make about the other, there's another way of doing it. There, there is people who say that in today's world, if you're making a mobile app, the problem with the mobile app that if you release a mobile app into the iTunes App Store and your app is bad, you can end up with one-star reviews and you can end up with things that you can't get rid of and it says this is shit, this is shit, there's no users and then you, you have to fight to try and get rid of those later on. <sighs> it's hard to disagree with that. It's true. The problem is that uh, there's no there's no easy solution meaning ideally you would release it in in some sort of secret environment and have loads of users and then destroy it and then release another product when you've learned all your lessons it's complicated to do that so it really depends on what the product is what w the only thing i can tell you for sure is we know what's wrong it's wrong to spend a lot of money uh, with no user feedback because that equals color but to spend a little amount of money with uh, lots of user feedback, that's great. But sometimes you can't do that. So sometimes you have to do a little bit of polish on your product in order so it doesn't die completely. And then you see what happens. I'm not sure if I've answered your question fully, uh, but there's no magic answer. It depends on what it is. But if I had to guess, I would say it's better to release simpler product and then get as much feedback as you can. And have like fo focus group for for testing, right? In real life. Well, focus groups. You know, Vitaly's one of Vitaly's slides says that nothing ever useful has come out of a focus group. The problem with focus group is you have to know how to use them, because otherwise, if you don't have experience with focus groups and you try and run a focus group on your own, you will end up only getting the answers that you want anyway. In which case, why are you doing the focus group? Uh, getting user feed, it's if you can, if you can afford to get, you know, a th hundred users in a focus group, that's great. Congratulations, you'll get. But that's very complicated to organize. Sometimes it's easier to just release the product and see what happens. Thank you. By the way, are you the guys last familiar? Question? Yeah. No, uh, oh, sorry. Yeah, if there's, there's another question, I'll. Uh, I'm happy to take it. No. Nobody? No, no, okay, in which case I'll tell you one quick story which pertains to that. Do you guys know who Tim Ferriss is? Yeah. Timothy Ferriss? People know who that is? Are you familiar with how he, how he titled his second book? Yeah. Well, I'll tell the story really quickly for those of you who aren't. So, Timothy Ferriss had this <laughs> successful book, The 4-Hour Work Week, and it was, it was a sort of self-help slash glorification of his own life book about that a lot of people really liked. It was a motivational book. And he... Uh, he, he said about trying to figure out how he's going to title his second book. And he wanted to, uh, he had this problem similar to what you just described, which is he, he actually didn't know what to write the second book about. So he, but in other words, he wasn't sure exactly, should he write the book first and then try and sell it? Or should he try and figure out what to write the book about? So he came up with what's a very interesting idea, and it's interesting to think about what that means for product design, is he ran a, a series of Google AdWords campaigns. And he, he ran a series of Google AdWords campaigns for non-existent books. So basically, it was a bullshit ad campaign. It was the title of a book, I don't know, you know, how to fix a car in five minutes. And then he would, he ran like 200 of these campaigns, and he would continuously compare which ones of these are converting well. And then, when he found one that worked, the one that worked 10 times better than everything else, which was called The 4-Hour Body, uh, he, and it was, I think there was a subtitle, like how to, how to seduce women and be a Superman, or something like that. Then he said, okay, I'm going to write that book because that book is going to be successful. So uh, th the moral of the story is I don't think that's how you should develop products. But I'm saying that Timothy Ferris, the reason, the, the reason I give this example is he came up with an interesting idea of how you can use data without having to actually do produce the book. So it's something to think about when you're thinking about, well, 
what do we do? Do we need to polish the product to get feedback? Do we use focus groups? Do we ask people? Do we show people wireframes? What do we do? It doesn't matter. There's various different ways. There's a hundred different ways you can get data from people. It depends on whether it's mobile. It depends on whether it's a web app. It depends on whether it's a book or whether it's an actual physical piece. But uh, anyway, I guess that's pretty much it. I've got 30 seconds left. So thank you very much for listening. And um, that's about it. If you do need to talk to me otherwise, you know how to get to me. Okay, thank you very much for your lecture. Hope will be uh, more people <laughs> watching the weather. Um, okay, uh, that's it. And just to remind you, uh, tomorrow there uh, will be a basketball match and it's at, n at 9, not at 10, as Kuba said. Oh, he said 10, okay. Yeah. Uh, do, by the way, do we know, how long is the basketball match? Do you just know one hour. One hour and it's like a tournament of however many teams we get. Some oh, teams, do? and we are still uh, looking for people who cool. would like to have. And is it outdoors or indoors? <laughs> uh, we'll see, we'll see. <laughs> cool. All right, thanks a lot, guys.